Delta Development Commission gets 11 man advisory committee. I therefore want to urge this advisory committee to discharge its responsibility diligently and effectively. Shelve your demands until we defeat coronavirus. President Buhari appeals to health sector workers. House of Representatives to intervene in current ASU strike. It affects the graduation of our children, particularly the masses' children. And on Good Morning Nigeria today, we take on the second part of our discussion on economic implications of coronavirus, plus a partnership between Nollywood and the Nigerian Army. Coronavirus, which has ravaged China, Italy, and Iran with isolated cases in Africa, including Nigeria, which already has recorded two cases, is progressing from being a global health emergency to become a major threat to many economies of the world, with far-reaching consequences on businesses and stock markets. Uh, absolutely, uh, Kiria. Now, remember that this was what prompted our uh, topic two days ago, that's Monday, when we discussed coronavirus and its economic implications for Nigeria. And our guests obviously were emphatic that uh, since coronavirus is impacting negatively, first say on the global oil price on which our revenue projections and by extension our national budget are predicated, uh, there will be serious implications for our economy. Of course, Kinsley, you know, they noted that the 2020 budget was predicated on the oil benchmark of $57 per barrel. And as it stands currently, the crude oil price is fast going south, you know, with postulations that it might crash below $30 per barrel in the coming days. No question about that, uh, Kiria. Yeah. We are seeing the, the uh, price war between Saudi Arabia and, and Russia. And the grave implication is that revenues for Nigeria might uh, drop sharply and funding the 2020 federal budget, which some economists had earlier described as being ambitious, might become even more challenging for the government. And a uh, little wonder, Kinsley, you know, President Buhari uh, war was worried over the impact of the coronavirus disease on the nation's economy and they swiftly constituted a five-man committee uh, on the eve of Monday to quickly assess the situation and advise the federal government on the next line of action. Now, the committee is chaired by the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and uh, National Planning. And it has a mandate to revisit and reverse downwards the crude oil benchmark of $57 per barrel. But by how much will the crude oil benchmark be lowered? And what effects will the ongoing spread of coronavirus have on uh, Nigeria's budget, the stock market, and economic sectors? In the weeks and even months ahead. Yeah, there's no doubt uh, that there will be consequences, Kinsley, you know, if uh, yeah. there's any sharp drop in oil price. Okay, well, yeah, these. Yeah, but as you know, as we, I mean, you and I were all set on Monday. Mm -hmm. It isn't just the oil price that is of concern to us. Mm -hmm. uh, we are seeing a slowdown. The shipping uh, businesses have been affected, and China and Hong Kong, of course, Hong Kong is part of China, mm -hmm. major hubs for shipping. Uh, so there's a slowdown. Aviation, there's also and a slowdown slow down. in aviation. Uh, uh, it's actually not in all sectors. But for Nigeria also, as a yes. nation, you know, yes. that relies solely on oil as a major source of revenue, mm -hmm. uh, the impact is going to be devastating if nothing is done. And I'm happy that uh, you know, the, the president is already doing something, you know, to, to uh, checkmate uh, whatever would be the consequences. Well, he's already approaching the, the National Assembly, of course, for a revision of the takeoff so, date exactly. of uh, the uh, VAT, which was increased from 5% to 7.5%, Kiria. Yeah, these and more questions will engage our guests on Good Morning Nigeria today as we have the second part of our conversation on the economic implications of coronavirus in Nigeria. It's good to have you join us again this morning, this beautiful morning uh, here in the Abuja capital city of Nigeria. My name is Kirian Umayo.
And I'm Kingsley Osadolo. I join my colleague Kirian to also welcome you to the program, reaching you live on the network service of Africa's largest television network, the Nigerian Television Authority. And uh, we also have a second topic, as we had indicated at the beginning, and that second topic has to do with a partnership between Nollywood and the Nigerian Army. Uh, what is that partnership all about? Of course, find out later on in our conversation segment, which will, of course, uh, today's program, as always, will include uh, newspaper review your business and others. In the meantime, uh, let's take, uh, Kiran, I was just going to say sports as well, but I don't have time. You saw the thrashing of uh, Tottenham, <laughs> exactly. uh, last night, and of course, they've been eased out of the European Champions League. In the meantime, Musba Don Wahab, who is also a keen follower of sports, gives us the highlights of the money news without the sports, by the way. Musba. All right, good morning. There won't be sports of this morning. Let's uh, talk about news for now, uh, Kinsley. An 11-man advisory committee has been inaugurated by President Muhammad Buhari for the Niger Delta Development Commission, NDDC. This, the president said, is in furtherance of his administration's new vision for the area, as well as policy thrust aimed at achieving sustainable peace, security, infrastructure, and human capital development. Advisory committee to discharge its responsibility diligently and effectively working closely with the ministry. My new assignment requires selfless service to our people in the Niger Delta. I look forward to seeing positive changes in the affairs of the Commission as well as on the ground in the Niger Delta region. Meanwhile, President Mohamed Buhari has appealed to workers in the nation's health sector to bear with the federal government in their demands as it braces up for the challenges posed by coronavirus to the economy. The president made the appeal when the joint health sector unions, as well as the Assembly of Healthcare Professionals, paid him a court visit. We are here, sir, to say that you help us get those very patriotic sons and daughters of this country, very patriotic health workers, to be recommitted, to be re-energized, to manage the health system better for Nigerians. Your case will certainly receive attention, but uh, we must bear in mind the condition uh, the country is now. Coronavirus is affecting what we so much depend on. Uh, petroleum industry and therefore revenue. So please let us be patriotic. Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo says no stone would be left unturned in addressing all challenges confronting businesses in the country. The Vice President gave the assurance during a court service to his office by members of the Kano State Chamber of Commerce seeking government's urgent intervention in the epileptic supply of power in the state. We have about 300 uh, industries in Kano and it's abundant. We need intervention from the federal government. With the energy, it will make our industry to be more competitive. More especially in terms of production, we can improve our produce at, at affordable price so that we can compete favorably to whatever product that can come inside the Nigeria. And to the National Assembly, where the Senate has passed the company's Allied and Allied Matters Act repeal and reenactment bill 2020. The legislators are to also embark on the amendment of Finance Act 2019 as requested by President Buhari. That the administrative effective debt for the increase in value added tax from 5% to 7.5% is the 1st of February 2020, that animal feeds in court are included in the list of basic food items that are exempt from value-added tax. The House of Representatives has expressed concern over the strike by the Academic Staff Union of Universities, ASU, and resolved to intervene and find a lasting solution. Is causing this strike year in, year out. There are three outstanding agreements signed by the federal government and not implemented. It's not just abrogating blame to the government. 
who are the government? It's me and you. Each among us sitting on this, in this green chamber and in this chair have known the economic situation of this country. Mandate the relevant committees to follow up after leadership intervention to ensure compliance. Because it affects the graduation of our children, particularly the masses' children. Content providers from within and outside Nigeria have converged on the corporate headquarters of the Nigerian Television Authority, NCA, for emerging skills and content development to boost digital television, effective management and successful monetization. Sit from analog to digital broadcasting, this cannot come at a better time. No matter what platform, what television station you are, if you don't have content, there's no reason to be there. And that's a bit of the news this morning. Good morning, Nigeria. We'll continue after this break and the second leg of discussion on the implications of uh, the coronavirus on Nigeria's economy will be up for discussion. Good morning. process from grass to glass taking great care in every step to ensure the milk that gets to you is of high quality great tasting and enriched with essential nutrients that are great for your family <laughs> available in dano cool cow dano full cream dano slim and dano flavored milk ha, not so fast look i'm tired I want to check out of this country for greener pastures. Just calm down for a moment. Please sit down. <sighs> Do you have a job where you're going to? Uh, no, but someone is arranging, you know. Listen, uh, listen, listen, Alinko. Checking out of this country without proper planning means one thing. Unimaginable begin. Eh? You know, I've been in the diaspora, but legitimately doing great things at home and abroad. As I've been saying, without the proper footing abroad, the risk is not worth it. Listen, Alinko, it's better to be home than be trapped abroad or even end up in prison. My name's uh, Mr. Muftao Abiodun Balogun. We started this business four years ago, and this is the production outlet where we do about 4,000 to 5,000 birds per day. With the closure of the border recently, we've been experiencing massive surge in demand. Our sales per day now is going to be between 15 to 20,000 birds. We needed to expand all avenues because of the multiplier effect is creating. And the most interesting thing about this closure is that many of my farmers today are farmers with the recently, and they are young graduates. What the government is doing will lead us right. And I can tell you, if the government sustains this thing, sky will not even be our limit.
and the program is Good Morning Nigeria. And next is Business News with Abdul Karim Zurumi. Nigerians are eagerly waiting for the reports from the Budget Review Committee set up by President Muhammadu Buhari to redeem the 2020 budget estimate. This committee was set up in response to tumbling crude prices which may require cuts in the nation's budget. Chaired by Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Zainab Ahmed, the committee is set to review the $57 oil benchmark for the 2020 budget. Meanwhile, the Russian Energy Minister, Alexander Novak, says Moscow is open to cooperation with OPEC in a bid to stabilize the oil market. Russia had failed to reach an agreement with OPEC on a proposed oil production cut by 1.5 million barrels per day, but says doors are still open for future cooperation, with various tools including reduction and increasing of production. Saudi Arabia had announced plans to cut oil prices further to its buyers in a price war with Russia, forcing global price crash resulting in the biggest single-day loss in a decade. Now let's take a look at the Nigerian Stock Exchange to see how the market fared on Tuesday 10th of March 2020. With business news, Abdul Karim Zurmi. Many thanks, Abdul Karim Zurmi, for the business packet. Next is New Super Review. Welcome, Bayo Atayabi, our uh, newspaper reviewer. Bayo, it's good to have you again today Thank you, on the show. Good yeah. morning. Mm. Good morning, Kingsley. Yeah, Bayo, good to see you. Thank you. All good right. morning, Nigeria. All right, uh, uh, let's begin this review with a Daily Trust newspaper. We're going to go from top to bottom of the Daily Trust newspaper. Despite crack, anti Oshomole NWC members set for neck. It's on page 50. And coronavirus affecting our revenue, says President Buhari. Uh, this story is on page three. Peter Said Sean CBN roundtable over a mayor Sanusi's banishment. You read more on that uh, on page seven. Now the list story on Daily Trust this morning. It deposed a mayor Sanusi uh, held to court to challenge banishment with four riders. Sanusi wants Lagos, but moved to local area and then away. Dethroned Sanusi makes case for M.A. Bayero. New Kano M.A. to receive staff of office today. Airfire appoints Sanusi vice chair of Kaduna Board. All that on page five of the Daily Trust newspaper. Of course, you can see the photo story. You can see the photo story on the front page of. Uh, of the Daily Trust newspaper, that's of course uh, uh, showing uh, the new mayor uh, when he arrived to the palace uh, to take office. Uh, that happened yesterday. Uh, they call it the first outing of the new mayor of Kano, His Royal Highness Aminu Ado Bayero. And below that, uh, we have a convocation. Unilag VC accused of abusing procedures, disregard to counsel, is on page 11. Zamfara Assembly relocates to a primary school. Find out why on page 50 of uh, Daily Trust newspaper. And now, no special treatment for Kalu Darye Nyame Meto in Kujia prison. It's on page 10. All right, uh, let's also take a look at the front page of the Punch newspaper. The lead story is also on the uh, Sanusi issue. Uh, it says Sanusi to challenge detention and forced exile. And uh, Kano continues 2.2 billion naira fraud probe. Uh, three writers to that uh, headline. It says, Council say depose them you have been subjected to maximum trauma. And may God bless us with good leaders. Praise ex-Kano ruler. 
Aerofi offers deposed monarch Kaduna board appointment. Details of this story can be found on page two of the Punch newspaper. So we go now up above that, um, right uh, from the very top, border closure, customs make 697 arrests and 7.4 billion era seizures. That's page 32. Senate queries $4 million payment to lawyer from ECA. ECA stands for Excess Crude Account. Stock market investors lose $656 billion era in one day. That's page 31. Petrol imports gulped $1.7 trillion era in 2019. That's attributed to the National Bureau of Statistics. Two earpieces beside the nameplate, UNN, Union Lauren, ABU, and others join strike. OAU shuns action. Union Lauren is surprising. First time probably in two decades. Malami rejects call to pay recovered loot into Federation account. That's page 11 in further detail. And then you also see the photographs there on the front page, uh, straight out of Kano, uh, showing the new Emir, Amin Ado Bayero, during as Kirian also read from the Daily Trust, his maiden visit as a monarch to the Emir's palace uh, in Kano. You see the Rolls Royce, uh, two photographs there that uh, conveyed him to the Emir's palace. Marking day signs are Motakum Bill into law and warns criminals. Gunmen kill ex-soldier, abduct three in Kaduna. Benue plans to strengthen anti-open grazing law and others. That's page 12. Former Minister Aud Wobwe emerges new ACF chairman. That's Arewa Consultative Forum. And FCTA shuts Abuja markets over attacks on officials. One trillion naira looting. That's the kicker. Bochi to drag ex-governor Abubakar. So EFCC, page 22. Bio. Thank you. Mm. Well, the story of the deposed Emir of Kano dominates all the paper, and he has said that uh, he accepted the detrollment as an act of God, and it will be best for us all. Uh, the Emir thanked all the people for the opportunity for him to be Emir since 8th of June 2014. He says, Allah that gives has taken back. He has appealed that all people should cooperate with our family so that the family and the people will all remain one. We, are, we pray that the dignity uh, of the home and the family will not be undermined. He thanked the people and says that, well, God's will shall be done. Meanwhile, following the banishment of the emir uh, to, from Kanu, he was said to have headed for Nasarawa State. The governor of Nasarawa, Abdullah Sule, had to hold a meeting with first-class traditional rulers, among which were the Emir of Kefi and Lafia. And eventually, it was to take care of his accommodation and his upkeep. Initially, he was said to have been exiled to Opanda, which is in total local government area. However, after the meeting by the uh, governor and the uh, first-class traditional rulers, it was later said that he was to be exiled to Loko. There's already another indication that he has left Loko for another location. Meanwhile, uh, there have been reactions about the deposition of uh, the former Emir, uh, former president, Ulushego Basanjo, in a letter says that it is sad and it is also good. He says sad because it is undeserving, but it's good because uh, he has paid the price for the part he chose and it is in the best for <coughs> the interests of our country and for our humanity. Uh, the People's Democratic Party, through Kola Logodia, has described it as a political blunder. Meanwhile, a professor of Islamic uh, political theory in the Maitama Yusuf University in Kano has said that Emir Sanusi brought the problems onto himself by openly indulging in politics. Uh, meanwhile, Aminu Adubairo, who succeeded him, yesterday has a formal outing. He moved to Nasara Palace, where he received homage from all title holders. He also sought the blessing of his mother. Meanwhile, his younger brother, uh, Nasru Adubairo, has been appointed the Emir of Pichi. He, he steps into the throne that he left to become the Emir of Kano. So there are indications also that possibly today there could be a presentation of staff office to the new Emir of Kano. Yeah, you know, it's a, it's a good storyline. You know, the, the issue surrounding, uh, you know, his uh, removal is uh, something perhaps uh, people like me 
may not be able to understand. You know, that's, that's kind of politics. And of course, uh, yeah, like Kabasanjo wrote, you know, uh, you know, his letter has two tones there. Yeah, he said it's good, then it's also bad. And he, he made the line, there's a line there where he said that uh, it is the path that the man chose to uh, uh, to throw that actually, you know, resulted to what happened. You know, so for me, it's, it's a don't tip. But what I do understand is the aspect of banishment. I don't know what that is all about. You know, you, what the person be well, banished I from? I think it has its roots in the chief tenancy law of the former Northern Nigeria. It's not the first to be banished. You recall that in 2014, Emir uh, of Jokolo of Gwandu was also banished. Incidentally, it was to the same Nasarawa uh, Nasarawa state. At that time, I think it was to uh, Ubi, local government area, where he was banned. Later on, a court, a high court in Kebi, uh, annulled the, his detronment. Uh, even during, for Kano itself, during the era of late Adobairo, mm -hmm. there was a time during the era of Abubakar Rimi as governor of Kano, there was an attempt at the Emir, which eventually cost the governor his, his uh, second term bit in, in Kano. Mm -hmm. So there have always been that uh, big challenge for, for Kano okay. about the position of emirs and what have you. Now, like this story, Zamfara Assembly relocates to a primary school. What, what happened? Well, that, that story took me by surprise. I missed it somehow, but apparently there probably is some challenge with the State House of Assembly. I, I didn't quite follow uh, that one closely. Well, there's a story on uh, University of Lagos, uh, which has to do with the convocation. Mm. The University of Lagos had uh, earlier advertised its uh, convocation ceremonies uh, to uh, take place. But, but of course, there appears to be some power play uh, between the governing council and the uh, management of, of the school. The, the which, of course, is accused yeah, of uh, abusing the, a procedure. Yeah, the, 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 the vice chancellor to council. and so on and so forth. But how, how I, I'm just wondering... Uh, because it was the NUC that, that then issued a directive for the suspension of, of, of the convocation uh, uh, ceremonies. I mean, as I said, the ceremonies had earlier been advertised. One of the points that had been reported in the papers had to do with uh, who should deliver the uh, convocation lecture. You know, one said it was a minister of the Federal Republic. Another said, no, they wanted uh, a former head of state from somewhere in West Africa to, uh, <coughs> excuse me, deliver the convocation lecture. But obviously, I mean, if you're having a convocation uh, ceremony, uh, all the uh, principal officers uh, are usually present, chancellor, pro-chancellor, which of course will include your governing council, and then uh, uh, members of the Senate, you know, for the degrees are then formally awarded. So the question that arises, because this is strange at the University of Lagos, to be honest with you, uh, was, I mean, how, why is there this communication gap as it were? Well, even if there's no communication gap, the issue here is that someone has to take a decision on, on, on who, you know, you know presents the, the, the major lecture for the day. Somebody, if it's not, a, you know, a collection of the members of the Senate, it could be the VC. Somebody has to be the, the person to choose who will do that. So why should that bring a, a kind of discord, you know, in a, such a university with a very you know, a reputable there, university there, of, that, of, the, Kiria, of that caliber? It could possibly be one single individual at the side. There's a ceremonials committee. Mm -hmm. Every university has that or should have it. Uh, they, they, you will have a short list of persons mm -hmm. and then of course you have the uh, visual uh, debate and then mm -hmm. the, of course the committee will then agree and then pass it on you know uh, upstairs to say mm -hmm. this is what we are doing. But what is what is uh, important is that a convocation ceremony uh, is a festival as it were of that particular it's institution. A of a yes, yes. yes. It's a festival and a celebration of of, uh, of excellence and the fact that these uh, persons have been through your crucible and you're now yeah. sending them out into the world. So uh, why is this, this called lingering? I, I believe that the decision lies on the man who is the alter ego. After passing through other committees and what have you, he, you know, everybody will not agree on, on who does what. You know, at the point, someone will say, look, I'm the, he's the VC. Like, okay, fine, this is my, okay, this is your police, or whatever, okay. This is what I, I chose this person to do it. So I think so for the National Universities Commission to have intervened, apparently there must have been signals that there was danger coming. Absolutely. And therefore, the best thing to do is for them to sort their acts together. The reputation of that institution is at stake. Exactly, so they exactly. Shouldn't, they shouldn't toy with it. That is a great un un university. The university, yes. Now, let's go to the editorial this morning, you know, which is very interesting, if you ask me. Now, no immunity for legislative officials. 
Uh, let me just, just take one paragraph. Here. The House of Reps has recently been criticized over the plan to extend immunity to principal officers of the federal and state legislatures. Uh, the bill for the act to alter Section 308 of the 1999 Constitution and extend immunity to cover presiding officers of the in, uh, legislative institutions was sponsored by Shegu uh, Odubmi of all progressive Congress. But one other one. It is gratifying that some members of the House have lampooned their colleagues for even muting the idea. Minority Leader of the House, Onebun Dudi Ilumelu, wondered why some members were promoting such an idea at a time Nigerians have been, uh, you know, uh, when Nigeria is in a, a, a critical situation with respect to uh, security. Thank you. Can I quickly comment on uh, what happened yesterday at a Commonwealth Day ceremony? Anthony Joshua asserted that I was born at Watford. My heritage is Nigerian. I come from Yoruba people. I am proudly Nigerian. I'm proudly British. Mm -hmm. He was uh, at the Commonwealth ceremony and where uh, Her Majesty the Queen too was also there. And interestingly, he added another one. He said, uh, we as a people like what we call pounded yam and egusisu. This is a food that is commonly eaten among the Nigerian people. Now coming to about the yeah, immunity. It, it keeps talking, that's fine. I mean, it's a good thing that he reminds our ambassador, but he has his next title defense in June. Mm -hmm. So enough of this Ponded <laughs> Yama stuff. <laughs> and and enough of this Ponded Yama stuff. His other half, his uh, British counterpart. Yeah. Half of him is Nigerian, half of him okay. is British. Yes. And the fact that he has two parts, the Nigerian part, will help him to overcome well, we, we, we continue to wish him the very best, you know, but... Uh, get he's, a, he's, a, he's, a, he's identified with Nigeria. Precisely. That's, that's what he's important. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah. proud of being let, yeah. let him get out of business. That's yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. Return to the gym, yeah. man, you know. Well, about the editorial, there has been concern that even the immunity provided for the president, the vice president, governors and deputy governors gradually elevates them above the law. The Constitution says nobody is above the law. Mm -hmm. But it has been... They are thought expedient to elevate them above the law so that the challenges of them as executive heading the affairs of state cannot be encumbered by unnecessary litigation. Litigations. However, uh, there, are, there are people who think that nobody should be above the law, especially when, the crime, when there is a crime. Therefore, to give immunity for criminal liability is elevating individuals above the law. However, civil litigation that could just be nuisance to obstruct uh, those executives can be at least uh, provided, immunity can be provided for those. However, the recent development is that member, particularly Shegun Odebami, uh, Odebumi was leading the debate that he cited the instance that, for instance, when uh, Senator uh, Bukola Saraki was being tried at the, at the Code of Conduct Tribunal, mm -hmm. it affected the legislative function and now they want that immunity extended to presiding officer at the legislature, both Senate and the National Assembly. Let me even speak like an ordinary Nigerian bio. As I was in Nigeria, there is not no need for that kind of exercise. There is no point doing that. You know, it's a kind of license for people to, you know, be above the law, like you said, and do things they want. What is all this? Well, see, if, you are, if your hands are clean, you don't have problem with these kind of immunities and stuff like that, you know, as a member of the National Assembly. And again, can something happen and you change officers? You change officers? So what happens to the immunity when you change officers? Save your breath. The editorial is saying that from a few opinion polls, Nigeria seems to be against exactly. that immunity. Exactly. There's nothing to do with that kind of... I mean, sometimes we waste uh, <laughs> <laughs> precious time, you know, on uh, matters that are really not particularly significant. By our trip, we would like to thank you for being around. Thank you, too. See you tomorrow. Okay, it's Good Morning Nigeria, reaching you the network service of the NTA. We're taking a short break. Now, when we return, we'll be discussing two issues. The first will be the second part of our earlier conversation on the economic implications of coronavirus. And the other, collaboration between Hollywood and the Nigerian Army. Nigeria is our country, and it's the only country we have. Irrespective of religion, tribe, the heroes of our past did their best to take Nigeria to where it is today. It will be unfortunate, I repeat, unfortunate, absolutely, if we don't keep Nigeria intact. We must put our differences behind. We must let everybody know that human beings cannot live together without some differences. But at the end of the day, our country is Nigerian. It must always come first. Thank you.
Get ready for the Unity Challenge reality TV show. Coming soon. Engineering skills and technology define the quality of television transmission output. Training and retraining of appropriate personnel on the management of modern equipment is therefore a key competition strategy in the dynamic television industry. NTA TV College, JOS, invites relevant desk officers to special engineering courses as follows. One-week course on audio engineering, operations and maintenance, date 20th to 24th April 2020. One-week intensive course on electrical power, earthing, lighting, uninterrupted power supply, UPS, inverter and solar system, date 1st to 5th June 2020. One week intensive course on studio broadcast equipment and outside broadcast operation. Date 15th to 19th June 2020. One week course on new technologies, optical fiber, IP technologies, automation storage and wireless technology. Date 10th to 14th August 2020. The venue for all courses is NTA Television College near Old Government House, Rayfield, Jaws. Course fee 40,000 Naira per participant. Accommodation inclusive. For more inquiries, please call 0803-314-4383 or 0806-980-9807. NTA TV College, Jaws. Training you to be the best you want to be. <laughs> Everybody love me when I do what I do. Cause when I come through, I got the power of cool. The power of cool. We have a 30,364 individual, 6,437 household. Boko Haram Yakorumu, Dagagalumu, and Daikichua Dorum Baga. The government has done a lot of things. Some corporate bodies have also done a lot of things, but there's still a lot to be done. We thank you for staying with us up to this moment on Good Morning Nigeria. And the first leg of our conversation is actually on the economic implications of coronavirus in Nigeria. And the topic was first discussed on this uh, platform uh, two days ago, that's a uh, Monday to be precise. And for today, to set the tone for part two of the topic, let's listen to excerpt of the first part of the discussion as put together by correspondent Aisha Ubali. And if we don't take all these measures, we are likely to have in the next one month, in the next few months, a situation where the income from the from oil and from other uh, oil-related imports, which increases our revenue, will go down, and we will be feeling the effect in not being able to fund our capital budget and being challenged in even recurrence and salary. 58% of the revenue is from Lagos. The rest of the 19 airports can't break even. The three international, none of them, all of them together, is less than 18% of the revenue. What it means in effect is that Lagos is subsidizing the 19 airports. So if, they, if you push them and they said, look, we're going to withdraw the subsidy because we, we just can't, then we have closure of the air. Now, which transport is working in Nigeria? The road is dead trap. The rail is a challenge. The only one that is Abuja to Kaduna, you've seen what, what... But unfortunately, $17 billion of that money will be coming from China, <laughs> you know, uh, from China Exim Bank. And uh, the Minister of Transport reported that uh, the, the April 2020 uh, uh, commissioning, of official opening up of the Lagos Ibadan uh, railway, you know, Standard Gate Railway, will not be possible because the Chinese uh, experts <clears throat> cannot resume work. And again, except of course, we also appreciate that Nigeria is one of the few countries where you produce a barrel of oil for more than $30. In other countries like uh, uh, the, the Middle East, they are doing it under $10. So the question will be, if oil dips to 45%, what can we be able to do 
to make certain that our production dips below ten dollars. Uh, it is worth while for I mean uh, for the federal government to consider opening the borders. If it was just because of smuggling, because of uh, 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 weapons and other crime committed through the land border, I think government since government has the capacity to even lock the border completely, they may also have the capacity to ensure there is adequate security there to supervise what is coming in and going out through the borders. I think. Uh, Now, those were excerpts from our conversation uh, on Monday. That's part one of, uh, of this topic. This morning, we have guests with us again in the studios. Professor Nazivi Dama, one of our regulars, is a professor of economics at the University of Abuja. Professor Dama, pleasure to have you with us on the program. Good morning, and good morning, Nigeria. Also here with us in the studios is uh, Professor Uche Uwaleke. Uche Uwaleke is a prof of finance and capital markets at the National Iowa State University in uh, Kefi. And most recently, uh, Commissioner for Finance in most state before they were judicially ousted. Uh, <laughs> Professor Waleke, a pleasure to have you with us. Pleasure to have you with us on the program. He has had the experience of being a Commissioner of Finance. Uh, absolutely. And that's very and interesting. Me, that's an experience. Again. And All also, right. also uh, <laughs> here in our studio, uh, here we have a new uh, King Siege, of course, uh, is an e economic and investment analyst. He's been uh, here with us whenever we talk uh, ec the economy. You're welcome to the program. Very good morning. And uh, hopefully, yeah. we're going to have another guest in Lagos. When uh, we are ready for that, we'll let you know. Um, he's uh, Johnson Chuku. When, when we set with that, we will certainly know. For now, Kinsley. Uh, uh, that's right. John and Ben are here. I mean, so we'll give the right of first refusal to the two new guests, of course, who are also regulars. <laughs> Nia, you were here on. Monday. So keep your. <laughs> so let, let's see. I mean, uh, first of all, let's get your opening statement, uh, mm. Professor Nazivi Dama. Yeah. I mean, we have all kinds of reports around the world, mm. and uh, it's also some analysts will say heartwarming mm. that the Nigerian government, uh, uh, personalized by President Muhammad Buhari, mm. is already taking uh, by steps mm. in light of uh, the emerging numbers mm. that are that are not salutary in any way. Mm. But what's your take on what's playing out in terms of the economy? consequences of coronavirus worldwide and most likely also for us in Nigeria? Well, in reality, if you look at the happenings in the world economy in the last 30 days, it underpinned two or three issues. Number one is the serious interconnectivity of the world economy arising from globalization and information access. And the fact that natural and human resource endowments are buried across countries and continents, you realize that the salutary effect associated with serious production collapse in the Chinese economy arising from the containment of over 63 million people in just Wuhan region have had negative transmissionary effect literally on all the major economies of the world. Because remember, the Chinese economy is the second largest economy in the world today. As at 2018, it accounted for over 14.3 trillion US dollars of the global biggest economy's GDP of 86 trillion US dollars. So if you look at that, um, you realize that there is so much interconnectivity in the world economy. Secondly, Whatever contingency strategies and plans economies could have devised to insulate their respective economies from this collapse, we now have another rider to the fact that a contagious virus that is suspected to have been produced in a laboratory has now had terrible consequences not only on the health sector, but on the overall economy in the world. And that underlies the fact that our global economy is extremely fragile and can be susceptible to external shocks. Seemingly simple, but very catastrophic. Because if you look at the statistics of the number of days, death associated with over terminal illnesses on a day, it's much, much more higher than the days associated with the coronavirus. But because of the contagious nature of coronavirus and its ease of spread, particularly in tropic countries or within tropic climate, it gives 
a serious uh, yeah, reverberating <coughs> effect. Uh, number three is the fact that whatever you do as a nation, you cannot insulate yourself from the global economy. And coming back to Nigeria, we can see that with all the uh, safety measures we have put in place in terms of putting our GDP oil price benchmark below the existing market level at a seemingly comfortable level that will give us some excess. Now, one single occurrence, which is outside the control of the uh, economy, can simply put all our plans into terrible jeopardy. All right. Uh, thank you for your opening comment. But uh, I'd, I'd like to take you back to the issue of uh, coronavirus, you know, being a creation of uh, a laboratory that has not been proved, you know. And of course, uh, even Kinsley, remember <coughs> two days ago when we talked about that, the WHO has not come up with any kind of a clarification of, of, of sort, you know. And uh, presently, we're not believing that that was what happened. But you know, the conspiracy theory gets some element of strength in the sense that the disease was first reported in China. But suddenly, there is another report in Italy in a town that has no history of massive travel to China and spreading on a wider well, scale. You know, one man can just spread it across, just one person. Just like it happened to Nigeria, just one man. You know, even during Ebola, one man brought it to Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So let's not go to that for now. Uh, uh, let's uh, first of all get a take of uh, Uche Waleke, Professor of uh, uh, Finance and Capital Market, Nassau State University. Now, the strategic position of China when it comes to, you know, global economy cannot, has never been felt, you know, uh, than now with the advent of uh, coronavirus. Because uh, from his analysis, it's very obvious, you know, that uh, 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 China is, uh, is very crucial when it comes to the world uh, economy. Um, he talked about uh, interconnectivity and globalization, which is, of course, what is playing out now, uh, you, know, you know, globally. Uh, what's your own take, you know, given the scenario uh, or scenarios, if you like, uh, across uh, the world, you know, in Italy, uh, South Korea, Japan, America now uh, is hitting America so harder now than ever before. Yeah, so, so what's your take on the whole thing? And again, how do you now, you know, bring it down to the Nigerian situation, which, of course, we're beginning to uh, uh, fight. Of course, the president just uh, inaugurated a, a committee, you know, uh, to look into how Nigeria can, of course, uh, stem the tide or whatever happens, you know, with, effect, with the respect to the uh, effect of coronavirus on the economy. Yeah, thank you, Kirian. Um, of course, the point has been made. China is the second uh, largest economy in the world. And in terms of export, it's number one. Um, a lot of manufacturing activity takes place in China. And what is happening now is disrupting um, supply chains, um, you know, you know ar around the world. Um, so you find that um, markets are also reacting, um, you know, negatively. In fact, it's been said that um, since the outbreak of the virus, um, that financial markets have lost um, over five trillion, five trillion dollars you know, taking off from financial markets. Um, and of course, uh, back home in Nigeria, the market has <coughs> lost about one trillion, you know, one trillion naira. Um, uh, whether you're talking about the stock market in Milan, you're talking about um, um, uh, even European um, um, stocks like uh, the FTSE, um, FSTE 100. Uh, if you also go to Asia, the Nike 225 um, is also, you know, plummeting. So if you look at all these um, stock markets around the world, including France, where the um, CAC 40 um, is also a measure of uh, performance. So stock markets are you know, down. But the uh, one thing I want to quickly point out is that um, in recent days, uh, we, be, we are beginning to see uh, some uh, upswings uh, in market activity. Um, even in China, the uh, Shanghai index, uh, uh, you know, an indicator for Chinese stocks he gained uh, five five percent um, just um, uh, last week, and that is because of the fact that the number of cases in China of uh, coronavirus cases is, is, is on the decline, you know, compared to uh, elsewhere. If you also look at the United States, for example, where in February we uh, the Standard and Poor's. Um, as well as the Dow Jones Industrial Average, two major indicators, you know, uh, plunged. In recent times, too, we are beginning to see um, a reversal of uh, performance uh, of Standard Poor's and Dow Jones Industrial Average, and that's on the back of the response by the U.S. government, you know, um, 
to this coronavirus uh, scourge. Uh, recently, the Federal um, Reserve, you know, cut the Fed fund rate, which is the benchmark interest rate in the U.S., you know, by 50 basis points, you know, to stimulate um, uh, um, economic activity on the back of the the coronavirus, um, you know, spread. Now, back home in Nigeria, we have also seen the effect on the Nigerian stock market, no, no doubt. As I told you earlier, the market has lost um, year-to-date return. It's, um, it's um, close to negative 10%. That is year-to-date return. Um, the market capitalization, equity capitalization, has plummeted considerably uh, to about 12.7 trillion naira now. So the effect is being felt, felt on the market. But I want to also want to point out this, that if you look at the history of um, market performances associated with um, um, uh, you know, sudden outbreak of um, illnesses, whether it is um, Ebola, <coughs> whether it is dengue fever, uh, whether it is even the coronavirus. This is not the first time the world is witnessing the coronavirus. Maybe I should say it. You can, you can Google it and check. Coronavirus was first reported in 2003, April 2003. Oh, okay. Then it was called the, the SARS. SARS. Yes, um, the severe uh, acute, acute respiratory syndrome, SARS. Uh, SARS was caused by coronavirus. And in April 2003, when it, was, um, when it, it first manifested, markets also came down. Okay. Shortly after, markets went up. The same thing with uh, even the HIV AIDS that was uh, this first reported in June 1981. We had the same market behavior. In t even recently, in 2018, October, there was Ebola. Ebola came... Financial markets also overreacted. And what happened shortly after, markets also picked up. So what I'm trying to say is that this is a fleeting experience we are, we are, we are having. And um, as long as uh, market participants keep focusing on the longer term, uh, okay, we are not likely going to see any major, any major upheaval you know, in, in our financial, financial market. So for me, it is fleeting. Now, on the part of the federal government, of course, is the point has been made. The budget was based on $57 per barrel. Look at what was happening. But of course, you also know that part of why oil prices are dropping is not just because of the coronavirus. It is more because of the, the if you like, the battle for supremacy between Russia and mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia, mm -hmm. the battle for market share. Okay, Russia thinks that because of the in, uh, um, increasing share production in the U.S., except price go down, the, it, it, will be, it, will, it will not be profitable for for U.S. to continue to do so. So they want to force down price. On the other hand, Saudi Arabia too wants to, um, you know, increase um, uh, production, uh, you know, uh, to force down price to be able to stimulate demand for for its for you know her products. So it is the that is what is really causing the the drop in. Um, oil price. So not, not only because of the coronavirus. So I'm sure that once Saudi Arabia gets an understanding, a leading OPEC <coughs> member with um, Russia, which is uh, with the champion of a non-OPEC um, uh, members, once there's an understanding to cut output, for example, the effect again, you know, it could be minimized. The Minister for Budget talked about um, revisiting the budget and the possible, you know, the impossible adjustments. The major challenge I see there is that 75% of the budget is recurrent. You know, including the, you know debt, debt service. So if you are if you are going to cut, it will mean you'll be looking at. Um, are you going to look at? Um, are you going to? It, it'll be difficult to say you're cutting salaries. You know, at this point, especially when minimum, um, you know, wage agreements you know have been reached. Okay, and on the on the part of capital, if you look at the money we are borrowing, 22.7 billion. He has made the point. 17 billion is coming from uh, China Exim Bank. That's a bilateral loan. The bulk of it is bilateral. So the, the much we can do is to, is to say, okay, let us make do with the multilateral uh, components of that. That's the World Bank and the African Development Bank. Okay, <coughs> while we suspend for now, or try to prioritize what we want to do with the bilateral ones coming from Japan, coming from G Germany, coming from Fr French Development Agency, and then um, coming from China, Exim Bank. And now, I, I can't <coughs> finish making my opening without talking about the states, um, you know, implications for states. It is going to have very huge um, uh, implications for subnational governments because, of course, you know, the state governments have also made their budgets based on assumptions, federal government, assumptions made by the federal government. Very, state governments made assumptions based on $57 per barrel. Okay, so what that means is that if oil price is um, being affected now, that of states too, 
you know, will, will, be, will be affected. And the fact, if you notice facts since December, allocation has been, has been on the decline. And a lot of states rely on fact to even pay salaries. Why did we enter recession in 2016? It was more because state, many states couldn't pay salaries. Effective, effective demands, you know, reduced. And so the country went into recession. That is what we should try to avoid this time. Okay, Professor Waleke, uh, thank you very much there for your broad sweep of, of, of the issues. Let's now bring in uh, uh, Ney Akinsiju. Ney, I mean, that's, uh, part of what we have seen uh, playing out uh, since the outbreak of the coronavirus is that China, which uh, of course is a major guzzler of, uh, of oil, has a much lower demand for oil. Uh, and then suddenly, you know, this part between Ro Russia and Saudi Arabia, you know, has come into the mix. And oil, of course, is a major determinant of, uh, of, 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 of our national revenues. From what we are seeing, all right, there seemed to have been some uptick yesterday, uh, but the figures remain well below $40 per barrel. I, I would like you to see a long drawn out, uh, a long drawn out uh, issue with regard to uh, the, the uh, confrontation between Saudi Arabia uh, and, and Russia on, on oil prices. Uh, and so, uh, what would that really mean for us going forward in terms of our foreign reserves and then the knock on effect on monetary policy and all that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I think the first set of uh, anxiety, you know, it's uh, petering out, as it were, um, from my readings of uh, the situation. Uh, between yesterday and this morning, uh, I think a new reality, you know, is dawning on both uh, Russia and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia. And like the international agency, I mean, the energy agency noted, the, the, uh, the executive director noted, that, 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 that part was definitely not needed between the two uh, uh, crude oil supplying powers. Uh, because we, we are talking of a double whammy here. We're talking of oversupply and, of course, declining demands. So when you, when you put the two together, it's, it's, it's a desperate situation that you are creating, not just for uh, uh, crude oil producing nations, you know, but for the, the global economy itself. Uh, uh, so I, uh, from my, I also got reports that uh, Russia is now considering a meeting uh, but looking at between May and June, what will happen <laughs> between March and May, we, we don't know. But I think what they, what they are trying to do is to test resolve. Test the resolve of the shale oil producers. Of course, test the resolve of uh, Saudi. Saudi, meanwhile, had come out to say that even at a range of $21 to $25 per barrel, it will survive. You know? One, they have, they have strong inventory. And of course... They, not just about in, in inventory, they have reserve they can unleash at any point in time in the, in the, in the market. Uh, Russia is banking on uh, a price under $30 per barrel that would injure shale producers because of the cost of production. You know, so the, the whole dynamics is about fighting for market shares. And in truth, shale producers are taking so much market with the control supply you know, with uh, the OPEC plus. Uh, but the, the reality now is that we, the, the crude oil producing nations cannot, cannot uh, contemplate anything less than $52 per barrel. So there must be a way of coming together to move up to that, to that ex, I mean, to that uh, treasure as it were. As of this morning, uh, it had uh, the price had moved to thirty eight fifty one thirty eight dollars fifty one uh, uh, cents as it were. That shows a movement up. Uh, it show it's showing moderation, you know. Uh, but for Nigeria, I I I, I think the, the important thing is to be cool headed about what our approach should be um, going forward. The review of the budget has been contemplated by the Minister of Finance. I, I, I think it should be for adjustment. But for adjustment to either sustain or move up, but definitely not to reduce. Because even now, the US is contemplating a number of fiscal stimulus. Uh, we cannot afford to go into another recession. We are just gathering momentum 
out of the valley, you know, created by the 2016 recession. So what we need at this point in time is to be able to be creative enough. Yes, we are going to have shortages of, uh, of uh, dollar supply, as it were. But our foreign reserve, as constituted at this, at this point in time, will still serve, will still fund eight and a half months of merchandise imports. You know, and of course, if you had uh, uh, imported services, perhaps four point uh, four to five months, you know, of, uh, of of that too. So, to the extent of funding imports, we are still within the the safe range. But what is important is to be able to also seek new financing sources, you know, in a way to stabilize the economy, you know, and make sure that demand is always empowered. Because that is important. Either consumption demand, uh, factory demand, and all, and all that, merchandise demand, and all that. It's important we keep our head and look at that. All right, uh, very interesting. <coughs> you know, gentlemen, I, I'm just wondering why you know the uh, uh, the, the field uh, between uh, Russia and uh, Saudi Arabia should uh, affect uh, the global oil market. And why we are so uh, badly hit, if this continues, is the fact that we're just a nation that runs a mono economy. That has been there for, for many decades. And we wonder, how do we get out of that? Well, that may be a topic for another day. But, uh, you know, the last time the world experienced an uh, economic meltdown, Nigeria appeared to be uh, insulated from that. As case maybe but I'm not sure we're getting as lucky as we were then you know this time around but based on the consequences of uh, coronavirus that's one thing the prof said professor or what I could say that the market performance uh, associated with a you know a sudden outbreak of, of disease uh, uh, with global magnitude cannot be predicted you know based on perhaps this kind of conversation that we're having and when President Buhari, you know, inaugurated a committee, his thinking was that uh, that should be, we have to nip, nip it in the board. We have to see how we can now begin to plan uh, and see how uh, whatever heat that is coming will not be as devastating mm. as uh, one would expect. And I want to bring you in here uh, to let us know, if you're a member of that team, if, what areas uh, will, you be, <laughs> will you be contemplating uh, for us to make adjustments? You know, because one, you don't have... Uh, great areas to address. Now, how can we, you know, uh, be able to uh, have uh, uh, or, or develop a thick skin, you know, mm -hmm. that can enable us, uh, uh, you know, withstand any shock, you know, that comes from any any sector of uh, of, uh, of, our, of our development. Kirian, I don't envy any member of that team because I know they are on an extremely hot seat in view of the situation. Now, what has happened and the fallout associated with the collapse in the global oil market prices arising from one, the glut in the market and the fixation between Russia and Saudi Arabia is a clarion call for us. Remember, before 2019 election, the last Minister of State Finance indicated that the costs of production of a barrel of oil in Nigeria is one of the leading or is one of the highest among OPEC countries. The average is nine US dollars. As of the time Kachiku left, it was around 21 US dollars. And many people don't know about this. So a devastating crash in the price of oil not only reduce the quantum that will go into our country by the amount of the reduction, but also have consequences because of the high cost of oil production. Now, for a very long period of time, Kirian, we have said this, we are saying this, and we'll continue to say this. A population of 200 million people relying on a monocultural economy with structural adjustment programs initiated since 1986 on the 25th of uh, September, if I can remember precisely, when the second tier foreign exchange market was initiated and signaling all the reforms. Up till today, the oil sector represents the highest source of forex to us, even though it controls less than 10% of our GDP. Now, if you look at the structure of our economy, and what we are likely to go through. And with the preponderance of our expenditure, 
on the recurrent or yes in the recurrent component relative to the capital you realize that with the slide in the oil prices has serious negative consequences on the economy in terms of dampening aggregate demand and aggregate supply but what is important is for us to have a wake up from our deep slumber this is an opportunity for extensive retrospection and complete change of orientation and behavior as far as economic management is concerned 200 million people is a very big market everyone in the world cannot afford to relegate this market but what will make this market attractive are the specific domestic policies that the economy need to put in place to make it as attractive as possible relative to what we see, how people are trooping into China, how people are trooping into India, how people are trooping into Brazil. They say charity begins at home. Now is an opportunity for us to do four major things. Number one is for this committee, if it can have the leeway, is to tell Mr. President and anybody that matters, particularly the governors, for us to have very honest, frank, a long discussion as to how we can actually reduce the cost of governance and the cost of delivering projects in Nigeria. So that this is the first step that we need to do. Everybody knows that the cost of governance is extremely high. Some governors have almost 200, 300 special assistants. What are they doing? If you look at the salary of the political office holders, whether at state, at federal level, is exceedingly high. So we need to have conversation about having realistic remuneration. But beyond that, the cost of delivering capital projects, whether at federal government at the state level, is also exceedingly high. Let us walk, let us talk, let us agree on a consensus, particularly using the instrumentality of the National Economic Council to have that so that we put the economy on a proper shape. Secondly, is the need for, have, for us to have a stimulus a stimulus for the economy at the federal government level and also at the state level. But the question is, where do you get the finances to stimulate the economy? Precisely. Now, if you want to stimulate the economy in the context of lower oil earnings, it's for us to do the first thing. That is religiously going back to development planning culture so that we prioritize in a realistic manner every expenditure at our all level, federal, state, and local government level. But importantly, to take specific measures, to change laws, to change policies, to change perception in order to attract so much idle money in international sovereign wealth fund that can come as public-private partnership funding. Because as I've said it severally, with the current law, with the current policy regime, nobody will massively take his resources and invest in Nigeria because there are relativities and opportunities that are more positive elsewhere relative to Nigeria economy. And capital is always looking for the best avenue to be able to have safeguard, to have highest profitability, but also to have highest level of predictability. Now, if you have national development planning culture and you review the laws and the policies to attract massive investment uh, it is possible now when you complement that with domestic uh, optimal resource management it will send also a very big signals to others that you are serious i think these are some of the uh, things that we need to put in place in order to insulate the economy from the shock because, but much analysts are predicting that the downward trend in the world economy arising from the coronavirus is likely to be not too significant. Even though the IMF uh, and World Bank have projected that the global GDP is likely to shrink by 0.25%. And if you look at the GDP figures of the 15 biggest economies as at 2018, 
is over 86 trillion US <coughs> dollars. So we are likely to have a loss of over 425 billion US dollars arising from this virus. Okay, Professor Nazif Idaba, thank you very much. And uh, gentlemen, thanks a lot. I, I, I don't know, I just, uh, we have our guest uh, in Lagos, we're going to introduce him shortly. It's also one of our regulars on Good Morning Nigeria. I mean, when, when you have had, shall we say, a virtual shutdown, of uh, major economic activities. Doesn't it take quite a while to restart that? And what you lose in, uh, in the lead time for you to restart, do you regain that almost immediately? And so when you are having the, uh, I'm not a pessimist, but when we, I, want to be, I want us to be realistic. When therefore you are having this, uh, say that when you're having the projection that, okay, this might not be uh, particularly consequential, we can get out of it perhaps in the short to medium term. Let's, let's look at what is happening. I mean, shipping activities have been disrupted. Uh, major deliveries have also been disrupted. Airlines have canceled their flights. And if you cancel a flight and an airline and an aircraft is parked somewhere, mm -hmm. you, there, there, are, uh, uh, there are airlines that have hundreds of planes. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about those having one or two uh, aircraft. Hundreds of planes with employees mm -hmm. uh, who have also been asked to go on virtual forced leave, mm -hmm. unpaid. And, then, and so if, if it's unpaid, what did you do? Italy, I understand, has suspended as part of its policy measure uh, the payment of mortgages. Because if a country is on lockdown and people are not going to work and they don't earn money, how then do you expect them to pay their mortgages? If you don't pay your mortgage and there is a foreclosure and a forfeiture, of course you are on the street. Uh, so, I mean, the consequences could be there. But as I said, we have uh, John Sinchuku, another financial expert, uh, joining us from our Lagos Network Studios. John Sinchuku, a pleasure to have you with us on, on Good Morning Nigeria again. Uh, I mean, the entire world is uh, reeling, as it were, from the uh, consequences of coronavirus and other matters uh, immediately arising. From your perspective, what lies ahead of us as a country? Thank you very much for having me. Um, just like my colleagues there uh, have said earlier, uh, the, uh, the outlook for the Nigerian economy and the Nigerian society is um, not very prospective. Um, it's not quite positive. The, uh, the concerns expressed so far are genuine, uh, given the fact that we, as a country, depend on other countries in the world for, in, for several things, one of which is our export earnings. Of course, we've seen a drastic drop in crude price. Uh, we saw that even our burning light has dropped as low as $37 this morning. Um, of course, that we have a direct impact on foreign agent earnings. Beyond that, you just mentioned the issue of logistics, supply disruptions. Uh, more, more than 19% of our imports come from China. And China has disrupted its economy severely because of these coronavirus uh, infections. Then you now need to look at other export commodities that we export. They largely, be, I mean, beyond oil, the few things we export, uh, solid minerals, agricultural products, are also going to be affected. Then in all, uh, if you have to look at the overall implications, you could have, you are going to have a drop in your reserve. That drop in reserve could lead to a devaluation of the currency or the So, The government can comfortably take out their subsidy and then people will buy pump uh, uh, fuel at the pump head at less than 145 naira. And citizens will believe the government has done them a favor. So if eventually oil price recovers in the near future or in the future and prices go above 145 naira, people will not hold the government responsible for that. I think this is an opportunity for us to leave ourselves as a country one of the critical burdens that has, is vitiating our economic growth or development. Uh, and then the other things we have to look at is that what can we do to make this economy attractive and as an investment destination? I saw the professor from uh, University of Abuja talk about that. We should focus on that as well as to reduce the exposure of this country, economy, to shocks coming from outside 
uh, factors like uh, this coronavirus. Okay. Thank you uh, very much indeed, uh, uh, Justin Chugu. Um, we are going to come back to you uh, uh, as we make progress in this conversation. Uh, that will be a, 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 a in a short while. But for now, let's return uh, to Abuja studio and engage uh, uh, Professor uh, Uche Oleg. Uche Oleg, a short while ago, Kingsley painted a scenario um, that had to do with the uh, issue of uh, recovery mechanisms and possibilities. Uh, all the businesses um, around the globe, uh, some of them have been put on hold. And of course, we've known now that uh, the whole world uh, may have lost over 400 billion US dollars. In fact, uh, two days ago, it was uh, uh, said that the uh, aviation industry alone has lost uh, 150 billion dollars. Uh, now, to Nigeria, you know, uh, because our focus is on Nigeria and how we can address it. Do we have uh, the kind of, uh, you know, the financial muscle uh, to... Uh, see how we can not just be insulated okay, from a shock, but to also stimulate other aspects of our national life, apart from this reliance on, on oil, which of course is not paying at the moment. Yeah, uh, yeah thank you very much. Of course, we can't be completely insulated uh, from um, the effect of, um, I, I prefer to call it COVID. Uh, COVID-19, because as I mentioned earlier, we've had cases of coronavirus, um, you know, before now. Um, if you look at what other countries are doing, um, the U.S., for example, I me just mentioned earlier, is uh, cutting rates. Um, Italy um, is um, suspending tax payments in cities that are under lockdown, for example, as a way of stimulating the economy. Now, can we afford that in Nigeria? Uh, if you look at the recommendation by the director, IMF directors um, following the Article 4 consultation you know, on Nigeria. The IMF is still talking about further tightening you know, monetary policy. Of course, as you know, today uh, the um, um, monetary policy rate is at 13.5%, which is um, re you know, re relatively high. And, and that's because um, inflation <coughs> um, is also on the rise, which explained why the, in January, in the central bank had to also increase the cash, you know, cash reserve, um, cash reserve ratio. Now, if we are having a low interest environment, in spite of all that, it's simply because of um, the, uh, some of the measures the central bank, um, you know, has taken. Um, one of which is um, the increase in the loan to deposit um, ratio, you know, to 65 percent, which is injecting more liquidity, you know, in, in the system. So, by and large, the inflation threat you know, is, 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 is there. And um, we can't afford to say we are uh, cutting rates, you know, at this moment because of the effect on um, inflation. And again, the uh, pass-through uh, effect again on, on, on exchange rates, given the fact that reserves, reserves are coming down. So I want to submit, you know, very strongly, uh, by, by what, you know, reinforcing what Johnson said earlier. Uh, that was what I was itching to say, really. That's this is the time for us to take out the um, petroleum subsidy, the under-recovery that you know, we are currently e experiencing. Each time we, uh, there is a um, um, FAC meeting, okay, what usually comes out is that the revenue that the NMPC you know, reports is usually lower, and lower than what it ought to be because of under-recovery. Uh, because of petroleum, the, the petroleum subsidy. So now that oil prices are going down, this is the time for the government to, you know, uh, muster the will to remove this, um, <coughs> remove this subsidy. So uh, b b if we remove the subsidy, for me that would be a countercyclical measure, uh, because in the next couple of months we also see uh, some threats to inflation. One of which is the uh, increase in the VAT which um, is coming into effect uh, from 1st of February, from 5%, 7.5%, and the likely increase in uh, electricity tariffs. These two will rub off um, negatively on the um, you know, general price level. So to counter it, there is need for us to remove the, um, you know, um, so, so I, I, I think these are some of the things we should do. Now, talking about, um, uh, again, monetary measures or measures the central bank can take. If you also look at what the central bank did in the past, which helped the uh, foreign reserve situation, 
That's talking about some of the demand management strategies the central bank put in place, including restriction of um, uh, access with respect to 42 items. The IMF is asking the central bank to remove those restrictions, but I don't think this is the time to do so, uh, given the state of our, um, you know, our reserves and the state of our um, um, imports. Uh, Q, Q4 of 2019, we had a trade balance uh, deficit of over 500 billion, billion naira, okay? meaning that imports exceeded uh, exports by that. So the import level is, is still high. And, and, for, and for us to reduce that demand for dollar, the central bank has to find you know, um, other, other ways to ways of restricting access to forex. That's the only way we can conserve um, foreign exchange, um, you know, as, as it were. All right, Professor Waleke, thank you very much. I'm just saying, I mean, it's all, still on the issue of, uh, of uh, the right timing for the removal of, of subsidy on refined petroleum products. Uh, I, let, let, let me pose this to Nii Akinsiju. Part of what we hear in terms of the subsidy being provided, usually two arguments. One, we don't have enough uh, local refining capacity. Uh, we had heard in the past that the NNPC was going to fix its four refineries sometime this year. Uh, the initial target was for the first quarter of this year. First quarter is coming to a close now. Uh, there's been no news out of NNPC as to what a state of readiness is, you know, to get the four refineries back to uh, full production capacity or near full optimal uh, production capacity. So perhaps it might be later in the year. But we, we also heard, you know, repeatedly over the years, oh, that the reason why we are paying so much on subsidies is that take a look at the uh, prices of the oil market on the, interna on, on, on the international scene. Mm -hmm. That you find when oil prices rise, it means that government has to absorb part of the shock. Now, is there a possibility of a set-off now that oil prices are going down, which means that the refineries that are picking up these oil prices, even though those prices lead to futures, that are picking up those, uh, those prices, uh, the cost for us for importation to bridge whatever supply domestic gap that we have uh, could also then narrow our, 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 our subsidy outlay on, uh, on, on fuel importation or fuel supplies in general. And if that narrows down, then perhaps we might not need to scratch our heads too much in terms of where additional financing might come from. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a reality. But um, <laughs> fuel, uh, uh, fuel uh, PMS especially, is a political product. And we, we have to accept that reality. And uh, we also have a precedent that is very... Uh, public is public sensitive, you know, to matters of possible increase in the price of uh, of uh, fuel. Uh, two or three days ago, we were talking. Two days ago, we were talking of uh, crude oil price under thirty dollars. Effectively, at the point in time, it went to as low as twenty seven. Twenty-seven dollars, uh, less than forty-eight hours after we're talking of thirty-eight. You know, it is also possible that we'll be talking of forty, forty-five dollars in the next three or four days. Uh, it's it's possible, and it could also fall fall to. Uh, so that also defines the nature, you know, of our subsidy. The reality, in truth, is that with the fall of uh, the decline in price, as it were, uh, the the subsidy, you know, threshold would narrow. Um, it would also allow opportunity, you know, to also remove subsidy in the real sense of it. But being a political product, you know, we, we, we need to extend our consideration, you know, beyond that. Uh, if, if the Nigerian people, especially as represented by the labor movement and all that, if there is anything that is so touchy, you know, with them, it is this uh, this product you know but I, I think we can also overextend our thoughts beyond the subsidy um, we we have joint venture partnership that has also developed a lot a lot of high grow a lot of high ev evaluation over time though at this time the evolution of of course will also be moderated because of the nature of the market but i think the federal government had given consideration to it at the point in time i think 2018 or so that it is it will be reviewing the possibility of selling off a certain percentage of our holdings you know in this in these joint ventures and uh, for me, I am also looking at the opportunities provided by the uh, by the 
uh, electric power distribution companies. Uh, I, we still have some 40% uh, percent holdings, you know, lying idle, you know, belonging to the to the federal government in those in those uh, companies, the uh, the discos, as it were. I think a sell off of those holdings too would provide some uh, some backup too. Uh, I between these two, and of course the loan we are expecting from the multilateral agencies, from even the international capital markets, yes. you know, will still help us to uh, to mitigate whatever will be the shortcomings in, in the supply of uh, foreign I exchange. Just to, yeah, because uh, earlier uh, this year, uh, when the, the talk about the utilization of the proposed loan as it then was, before the uh, National Assembly, of course, the uh, Senate has already passed it. We had the Honorable Minister of Finance, uh, Budget and National Planning on Good Morning Nigeria. And she did say that the facility, it's a bouquet of, of, uh, of, of loans involving not just the federal government, but also some of the subnational yeah. entities. Mm -hmm. That's one. And that the budget, sorry, and that the loan wasn't intended to finance the 2020 uh, 20, uh, appropriation. Yeah. And these are for long-term, you know, projects. Uh, so how do we understand all of this now? Is it that we should proceed with this? Because these are soft loans, as it were, mm -hmm. with long-term uh, long, uh, repayment uh, periods. Mm -hmm. uh, should that be factored in at all in terms of our consideration of how to deal with, shall we say, the short-term short and even so. medium-term shocks mm -hmm. of coronavirus? I, Who takes I, this? I, I think so, because mm -hmm. uh, what, what we need now is liquidity. Um, as I said, we, we, we are not under any threat in terms of financing our, our imports, as it were. But what the, the issue will be reduction in reserve accumulation. And that, of course, also provides confidence issue for, for our investors, either local or foreign investors. So we, we now need to have uh, a straight channeling of dollars foreign exchange into a foreign foreign reserve so if it's through these multilateral agencies because the 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 one for uh, the china exim bank will be coming in terms of pre project delivery we may not be taking cash you know directly but we're taking we'll be having investment in cash about five billion worth of it from uh, afdb uh, world bank uh, and uh, uh, kfw and all that you know uh, even if it's for long term there is an entry point. This is the entry point that we so desire this, uh, this funding, as it were. Well, 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 I, I, think, it, it, I think there are two issues that are very contentious in what we have been discussing and which we seems to relegate to the background. The issue of subsidy is a recurring decimal as far as Nigerian economic management is concerned. There will continue to be subsidy on petroleum products in as much as two scenarios hold. Number one, in as much as we cannot produce domestically enough petroleum products to satisfy our need, there will continue to be subsidy. Whatever you remove, it will come back. Because we are operating a flexible exchange rate regime, and that exchange rate regime responds to global economic challenges and domestic economic challenges. So wherever the value of Naira falls relative to dollar, and in, as much as we are importing petroleum products, whatever subsidy you remove, there will be another recurrent subsidy emerging based on the differential between the Professor, earlier cost. Professor Dama, you, you have just said it all. Yes. If, if we, so, do, sorry, if, let if, me if we don't know, where to go to Lagos because of time, you okay. know, it's, it's a first sense here now. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if you continue to import a uh, 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 fuel, removal of subsidy is, is going to be a dream. Mm -hmm. It cannot work practically. Whatever loan that we are attracting, soft or for long-term projects or whatever you have, I mean, it would never work. You know, because this we have been discussing this on this program for, for years now. All right, so uh, let us just uh, drift from this issue of <coughs> subsidy. Let's go to Lagos and get uh, uh, jo uh, Johnson Chukwu to also come in here. Johnson, you've listened to uh, the, the, the last uh, submission by uh, uh, um, Akin Siju here, and I want to also 
to uh, look at the issue of uh, PMS, which he said is a, is a political product. Of course, its price is determined by world market forces. So we, ha we don't have even control over that. Just the fact that uh, Russia and Saudi Arabia um, um, are having issues concerning fuel is affecting the, the global oil market. And we are feeling it because of our uh, mono nature, uh, the mono nature of our economy. Now, you have heard that uh, there is a committee set up by the president to look at how uh, we can uh, not just insulate ourselves from the uh, consequences of coronavirus, but to see how we can have um, an internally generated mechanism that can enable us to uh, survive economically within this uh, period of uh, coronavirus attack uh, to the entire world. Uh, what is your take? Or what would you be telling the committee to do? Or if you're a member of that committee, uh, what would be your own contribution towards uh, uh, ensuring that uh, we get out of this issue uh, based on our own internally generated uh, uh, plans and, and policies that are implementable. Let me start by uh, making a little more contribution on the subsidy issue. Then I'll come back to your sec second part of your question. The uh, professor from uh, University of Abuja said that uh, unless uh, we have an, a flexible exchange rate, we may not be able to take our subsidy because the subsidy will come back as forex subsidy. I beg to disagree, and I also beg to disagree on the fact that PMS or fuel is a political product. Today, Nigeria is the only country in the entire West Africa that is subsidizing fuel. And let me remind us, a uh, couple of years back, maybe four or five years back, um, kerosene, or what they call DPK, dual purpose kerosene, was considered as the most... This is the network service of the NTA. We now join our outside broadcast crew for a live telecast. Please stay tuned. Nigeria first. I see the